Hello there, everyone. Welcome to the new year and back to the Bomberman channel. As you all know, the number one and literally only source of all things Bomberman news. So, rather recently, as in recently, I mean literally on Christmas Day, Peter Tirias from Kotaku published an interview he had with acclaimed Bomberman composer Jun Chikuma, someone who I intend to cover at some point. And given this interview, I'll likely be using this one as a primary source. Yes, it is really that useful. I'll be putting a link to this interview down in the description below so you can go check out the article for yourself. Anyway, without any further ado, let's just jump right into it. A voice had a thing for Jun Chikuma's music, though it took me a while to realize it. Even today, I often find myself humming the mantra track from Fox Nadu, me being Peter himself, the difficult side-scrolling action RPG for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Fox Nadu resonated because it conveyed a fantasy world that was so different from anything I'd seen before. The world tree was in decay, its corruption palpable every step of the way. The sepia-stained visuals and difficult gameplay were perfectly complemented by its moody, evocative soundtrack. While I've never played the game myself personally, there was just a huge playlist full of a bunch of Chikuma's works on YouTube. I actually went and listened to some of that stuff even prior to reading this, and I do have to agree, for an NES game that is a surprisingly jazzy soundtrack. And that, it turned out, was Chikuma's work. These days, she is best known for her massive contributions to the Bomberman series, almost single-handedly defining that series energetic, eclectic sound in the late 80s and throughout the 90s. Inspired by my fond childhood memories of her music, I reached out to Chikuma to learn more about the history behind Fox Nadu, Bomberman, and the rest of her impressive musical works. We chatted via email. Chikuma, who lives in Tokyo, studied to be a composer from her childhood. I always had elementary knowledge about music, such as the harmony and rhythm since I was very small, she said. When I was practicing the piano, I often became bored and started to improvise. I became accustomed to writing down the melodies I improvised, which made me a composer without knowing exactly what it was. I began to think about becoming a real composer when I listened to Maurice Ravel's string quartet on TV. I was very much moved by his novel melodies and harmony, and wanted to create something like that as well. When she was a student, someone she knew tasked her with composing the title music of news programs for TBS, as well as background music of documentary films. She drew influence from the styles of early 20th century modern classical music composers like, and I must apologize, I not pronounce these names to save my life, Paul Hindemith, Dmitry Shostakovich, and Sergei Prokovive, and so on. It was necessary for a professional musician to change constantly according to the producer's intention, she told me. So I tried to study various music to learn this kind of responsiveness. Shikuma entered the gaming industry in 1986 thanks to her agent at the time, who had a connection at Hudson Soft. She began by composing the soundtracks for her Famicom titles like Bomberman and Adventure Island before being asked to write the music for Fox Sonata. Now, I don't want to read this whole article verbatim to actually incentivize some of you to go out and read it. So we're just going to skip a little bit after a whole anecdotal bit about Fox Sonata itself. Fox Sonata is a side-scroller and an RPG at the same time. So I, now doing Jakuma, this is in quotes, tried to express both the rhythmical and vivid mood of an action game, as well as the storytelling beats of an RPG, Chikuma told me. I tried to compose universal music favored by all listeners, including various methods of classical music, jazz, pop, etc. Since games were a new type of medium, Chikuma was excited about composing for them, but she had to accomplish her compositions working within the narrow confines of the modest Famicom audio hardware. That's where her jazz background became invaluable. Since jazz could produce a high variety of chords with a small number of voices, she found many of its lessons important in her approach to NES music. The tone generator of the NES had just three channels, two pulse waves and one triangle wave, and one noise channel, she said. 
So it was necessary to express the music through melodic movements and construction, in place of colorful tones. That jazz technique was useful to express chord progression in the three main channels. She was assisted by the sound programmer at Hudson Soft, Toshiaki Takimoto, who did his best to help the team implement the darkly eclectic video game music of Faxanadu. In terms of feedback, Chikuma said, they left everything completely up to me. From the general directions to sound making details, I was able to work quite freely under these good circumstances. After Tiras explains the musical contrast between Bomberman and Faxanadu, the mic then goes back to Chikuma, who says the following. I was trying to mix various genres based on techno and electronic music, she explained. The first Bomberman was on the NES. Chikuma says the NES's tone generator was so suitable for techno that it turned out to help form the bleep style of techno, as well as what we commonly call chiptunes, which is game music sequence for sound producing microchips. Chiptune is the legacy of the NES, said Chikuma. On the other hand, bleep techno had a form root from the analog synthesizers. Game music picked up on it and gave special meaning to that bleep style. 1991's Super Famicom had very different sound hardware than its predecessor. On the SNES, as it's known in the West, a composer typically generated sounds by uploading brief recorded audio samples to the audio chip that could then manipulate and play as a custom instrument. The main problem was that the system only had a very small amount of memory in which to store said samples. So when it came time for Chikuma to compose Bomberman music on the SNES, it was a very different process that took the serious sound in a fresh new direction. The tone generators of the SNES were all based on samples, so I could apply house music techniques and employ breakbeats, she said. The SNES has an 8 voice PCM tone generator. There were 32 kHz and 16 kHz as sampling rates. With the former, sound quality will be clear, but the total sampling time will be short. With the latter, the sound would be sick, but the time will be doubled. As I wanted to use phrase sampling and breakbeats, I chose the latter without hesitation. As a result, I got a very unique lo fi sound, and I felt it turned out very good. In the 16 bit era, as with Fox and Aru back in the NES days, she usually had a lot of freedom in her approach to the music. In most cases, she said, they showed me the game while they were in the middle of working on it, and I composed it to suit it. Chikuma's pick for favorite Bomberman music comes on a surprising system, the Nintendo 64. The N64 infamously lacked dedicated audio hardware and rarely got much notice for his soundtracks, but that didn't mean a talented composer couldn't work some magic on it. I'm sure that the most remarkable title in terms of music among the Bomberman series was Bomberman Hero, she said, referring to the 1998 N64 release. It featured drum and bass and acid techno, which had been only known to fans of club music before then. The track Redial, which I played earlier, pairs electric piano melodies with drum and bass, and is still favored by a lot of listeners today. I asked about another of my favorite tracks, that being the World Selection theme, from the PC Engine's Bomberman 93, which never came out in America. I've used this melody since the first NES Bomberman, and it was one of the main melodies for the series, she replied. Originally, it was a song for the battle mode, and I later made it a chill out arrangement according to the scenes. The PC engine has six voices, which made it possible to produce many things. However, in my opinion, the NES had a stronger tone quality. Now, here's where things get a little more interesting, as in a little, I mean a lot. Chikuma went on to explain her philosophy behind her music. Basically, I am a composer who pursues cutting edge art. In other words, art suprematism, which I often call absolute music, she said. I don't like to express other things except music. That might not be suitable for a soundtrack composer because it requires a professional compromise. However, the combination and the balance of those elements seem to be interesting for listeners. 
having no connection with the composer's intent. I was curious about what she'd said, as the concept of making good music independent of the actual scene in the game was fascinating. What I call art suprematism, or absolute music, is very simple, Chikuma replied. I compose music only for music. In other words, I don't express any feelings or background to my composition. However, that has nothing to do with listeners. On their side, they're totally free to feel some feelings or dream various images, of course. I think it is natural, and that contrast is interesting. Chikuma has studied many Middle Eastern styles of music, which were an influence on her as a composer. I encountered Arabic music when I wanted to build up my ability to improvise. Classical Arabic music had an immense system of modes and rhythms, which enabled me to step forward a lot. Switching gears now as the interview pretty much ends there, I want to talk a little bit about Chikuma's art suprematism bit. While I think the end of the article somewhat grasps onto like what she means by it, I'm going to ignore the article because I don't want that influencing what I think that means. So, I find this a little weird inherently, because when you are composing for something visual, like a video game, more times than not, at least like ideally speaking, you have to actually see the game in order to get a good idea of what it is that you're trying to do. So, to that extent, I feel like that mindset is more so of a uh, back of the head sort of thing, right? Something to keep in mind, to not restrict yourself necessarily on, you know, the melody, the composition that you make. At the same time though, putting aside my knee-jerk reaction of, oh god, that sounds pretentious, uh, blocked, my thing is like, it also is like she's shooting herself in the foot at the same time because, like, wh while she stated that, you know, the players can interpret how they want the song to match with the stage or what it should mean to them, I'm like, there, it does result in an inherent disconnect, which makes it a little harder to ease into a lot of her pieces, especially the more abstract ones. Um, but again, I'm not gonna sit here and claim that this is like some absolute that she's going into, otherwise I'd imagine she'd be out of her job. Um, irregardless, what do you all think of this interview? Um, again, shout out to Tiras for having put this together, especially on Christmas. It was a good Christmas present, I feel like. Tell all in the comments below also about what you think of Chikuma. That's going to wrap it up for today. And until next time, I'll be catching you all on the other side of the boom.